say I got five major placements in a year, and let's say that those major placements each paid me 10000 That's still 50000 before taxes. My manager is only getting 20%. That's 10000 He can't live off that. Your sound ain't sounding right right now. That could have been bad. What's going down? It's the Music Entrepreneur Club podcast. We are at episode 83, still powered by BeatStars, BeatStars BeatStars.Live. Our free music business mentorship program goes down every single week, twice a week, actually, Mondays and Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Tune in at BeatStars.Live or check out MusicEntrepreneurClub.com for the full schedule. I actually got these glasses because they're clear and I thought there would be less glare, but... (laughs) Yo, I just wanted to, um, well, a couple things. The the last session that I had, we had a rep from a company called Koji. They uh, have developed a platform that allows you to create interactive links um, to like gate things. You can monetize with, with the links. You can in, in come up with like creative ways to engage your audience. I would really encourage artists and producers to check that session out because I think that these Koji links, um, you could do a lot of creative things with them. So, you know, we're always trying to introduce our audience to new platforms or tools or resources that we think will be beneficial to your businesses. And that was, that was definitely all of them. I think all the sessions do that, but I think this, this one in particular, um, it's new and we always want people to be up on the newer things first so that you can be first movers and take advantage of, of newer technologies when, when they get introduced. So definitely check that out. Um, and then ongoing, every Monday, I've been having a text marketing office hour session. So if you want to learn how and why to use text marketing or you want to discuss strategy, I'm doing that every Monday at 1.30. And the sign-up link is in the Instagram bio of the Music Entrepreneur Club. So go to Music Entrepreneur Club's IG, click on that link. It's a link tree link. Um, and you can sign up for one of the text marketing um, office hour sessions. Uh, it's free, just like our live sessions. It's free. And this past Monday, we had a really cool conversation. Um, Cloud9 joined the conversation. And he talked about how he was using text marketing as a producer and has been pretty successful with it. So we're going to keep those conversations going. Hopefully. Hold up. Is that archived? I want to watch it. No, it, it wasn't. It wasn't. Um, I have it. I have it, and I'm actually might I might post some highlights. I, I, I don't know, I don't know. I, I wanted to get more. I don't know where these conversations were going to go. Not that we're talking about anything that we shouldn't be talking about, but you know, I just they they they're not public, but they're going to keep happening on a weekly basis. And I yeah, might sounds a little <laughs> suspicious. It sounds a little sordid. If I'm being honest, <laughs> no, nah, I mean I might. He did say a lot of helpful things, so I I might go back to that session in particular and just cut a highlight to promote the text marketing sessions on our IG. Um, so thanks for me for thanks for asking that question because it reminded me to do that. Yeah, well, I'm a I'm a producer and I want to learn from another producer, so I would vote that you make it public, maybe on the NBC YouTube or something. I don't know. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. I mean, if there if there are parts that I think are super helpful, maybe I'll I'll capture those parts. I mean, some of some of the conversation is a little bit more elementary in terms of how to get started, and you know, people just kind of want to see the back end of Fan Connect, which is the the text marketing platform that that I use, and it's integrated into BeatStars. Uh, so maybe I'll just select some of the more important conversations, uh, not more important, but just some of the the gems that I think would be useful for a broader audience and. Um, post them so that's a good idea so i i, I want to talk about something that you brought up um i know we've spoken a lot about management and kind of how terrible of a position most managers are in the music business um because you know if and this is just an unfortunate fact if m- the majority of musicians, recording artists, producers, singers, whoever, fail. Um, and managers are working for a percentage of what they make. That paints a really bleak picture for managers, right? Yeah. I mean, unless you're managing multiple acts and you have a higher chance of success, somebody, you know, from the roster achieves some type of success, hopefully. Um, but I think 
for up and coming managers, I don't typically see them managing several at maybe three at the most um, and banking, even banking on three artists to one out of three artists to make it is, you know, a long shot most of the time. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of, a lot of people jump into management and, and think one way and quickly find out that it's not as fun as they thought it was going to be. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a short sightedness for all creatives and I'm including managers in that uh, category where, you know, if you're a rapper or producer and you're just starting out, you might think I'm going to jump into this. I'm super talented. I'm going to make a killing. It's going to be amazing. And obviously that's not really an accurate picture of, you know, the artist's journey in the music business. And I feel like a lot of managers in my experience kind of feel the same. They, They find someone who's by their standards and in their opinion, talented. And maybe that person's actually not that talented, or maybe that person just isn't just the right artist to attract a fan base. Um, and because the manager is more excited uh, for his or her, their own um, prospects and not so experienced that, that they're the best judge of talent that they just, um, you know, move forward with it and, and invest a lot of time into uh, managing this artist, or they don't invest the right kind of time or energy because again, they're just starting out, you know, a lot of, as a producer, you know how many mistakes I made for years. Um, management does the same thing. If if you're not super disciplined and and super focused, and and you're not learning and reading and and uh, trying to develop yourself every day, then you're going to make mistakes. And even if you are doing everything right, you're still going to make mistakes. And so, it's just crazy to me. You know, people say artists are crazy, and I want to talk about that topic too. Um, you know, you have a lot of audacity and maybe maybe something a little bit off mentally with you if you if if you jump into the music business, um, you know, especially today. Just say, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this for a living. But a manager, oh my god, that's that's a little bit harrowing. You know, just to to want to work for a percentage of what a creator who's probably not going to succeed statistically makes. It's a little crazy. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, other managers might look at me crazy and say, well, why are you a manager? But I I think, I honestly think that, that management sucks. Like I don't think that smart people want to manage long-term. You know, and there may be a few, you know, because you can reap the benefits if you have either a big act or a roster, like a, ma- a whole management company. But I, I don't think and, and you see it with like the Scooter Bronze of the world or the Troy Carters of the world. Like these are smart people that, that have gone more into entrepreneurship and have used like their experience and success as a manager to pivot and to get into other things that are a lot more lucrative because 15 to 20 percent for putting up with a lot of the stuff you got to put up with. Like it's stressful. And honestly, it, it, it sucks. Like I, I enjoy working with Ja. I only got thrust into management because like I it was kind of by default. And I, I'm definitely all in for supporting people that I know are talented and are good people and I know and love them. But I wouldn't be working with Ja probably if, you know, we, we didn't go 20 years back. Um you know, and he didn't allow me to be uh, m- more strategic. Like, I love the strategy aspect of it. Like, sometimes managers get into situations and they're more of just like glorified assistants. I'm, I, I don't sign up for that. Like, I bring, I feel like I bring more to the table and can talk strategy. And hopefully, you know, we move together as a team. If you just want to call all the shots and do what you want to do, then I, I don't really want to sign up for that. Um, and if you layer on top of that, you know, you're not very professional, you don't get back in a timely manner and, you know, you're late to things and stuff like that. Sometimes a lot of ego involved. Like I'm, I'm cool. And I just don't see long term like smart managers staying in the game. And that's why I my feedback to a lot of up and coming managers that I think are sharp. I like, yeah, you know, make sure your client 
is happy and, and they're reaching their goals. But at the same time, you got to manage your career too. Like where, where do you want to be in 10 years, right? How can you leverage some of the relationships that you have now that you have access to now to get where you want to be? Right. I, I always manager because you can get fired at any time. Like, I don't think Pat, the manager um, of Chance the Rapper, I don't think he thought that he would ever not be managing Chance. Like, I never thought that I would not be running Funk Volume, you know, but but you never know. And everybody has to be responsible for managing their own career. So how can you leverage you know, maybe you have access to rooms now because you, you are a manager of a successful artist. Okay, that's cool. But how could you leverage these relationships to accomplish what you want to get done in, in five to 10 years? And you always, so you always have to be, you always have to be thinking about yourself too, because, you know, your job can be non-existent tomorrow. Well, okay. So what headspace were you in when, when Funk Volume even was starting where you decided that yes you wanted to not only manage artists but you also wanted to because because you said well i'm not i'm not going to pick up on it but you must have been a little crazy right not i didn't i didn't know what i was getting into really and it wasn't like okay I, like i was in the beginning i was still look because in the I started because I got I got laid off, right? So I had the time and I had money saved, so I wasn't really rushing to get into anything. So when my brother hit me with the idea of, you know, getting together and talking to Hobson and maybe starting the label together, um, you know, it was just perfect timing. Um, and I didn't really know what I was getting into. I didn't know anything about the music industry. Um so yeah, I really just think it was perfect timing. And I, as we were getting going, like I was still looking for jobs, kind of like, okay, if I find something I like, maybe I'll just kind of do funk volume on the side. Mm. Um, it ended up being the reverse, right? Like I was doing other stuff on the side and more funk volume full time. Um, but yeah, I didn't know what I was getting into. Well, do you think it was good? Because I think, I think having that level of, of ignorance is helpful when you're when you're starting out because because I, I think there's this pattern where rappers and producers psych themselves out because they they do a little like too much research on the music business and they end up finding a lot of negativity and and then they end up um, not trying very hard but a lot of, like for me I, getting starting in, in my production career, I wasn't focusing on everything that could go wrong. I was just trying to have fun. And I think, you know, with you getting into management, you said you had no idea what you were getting into. So maybe you had a little bit more optimism and a little bit more energy rather than, you know, sitting there anticipating all the things that could go wrong. You were more focused on just making things happen. I, I feel like that level of, I mean, we, I'll call it ignorance. There's nothing wrong with being ignorant. Um, it's just a temporary state that I think all of us are in at one point, but I think that ignorance probably helped, you know, cause a more seasoned music business professional might have seen Hobson and said, Oh, he's in a bad situation with Tamika, right. Or his music is just kind of left of center. It's, it's not, it's not pop. I don't want to touch this, but you just said, well, let's try it out. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I was excited by the challenge. Um, just doing something different. Uh, obviously, wanted to support my brother. That's first and foremost. Um, but I was I was excited by the challenge. And even though I wasn't from the music industry, just hearing their music and seeing the initial reaction to it, um, I knew that I felt like they had something different. You know, I, I, and I felt like the there was a quality to what they were doing, um, especially at such an, an early stage, uh, that I felt confident. Um, you know, but I was really just ex excited by the challenge. And, but I, I go back and forth on whether or not, you know, cause some people prefer to just keep their head down and work, 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 work. And eventually their head hits a diamond, right? As opposed to like knowing what's ahead of you. Like, cause if you would, if even today, if you would have, if you asked me, 
would I do it again? I'm not sure. Like if I had to, I mean, obviously the ending minus the ending, right? Went through a lot of stuff. And even though we had success relatively quickly, you know, I would say three years in, 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 and finally starting to see a little bit of money come back. Three years to me is a short amount of time to start a new business. And I think for, for artists, you know, I don't, you probably gonna have to be in this for more than three years to start to see the fruits of your labor. Um, but I don't know which route, like ordinarily I would prefer to see the steps, right? If I want to be a lawyer, I know I have to go to college. I know I have to pass. Uh, I know I have to, to, to take the LSAT. I know I have to go to law school for three years and pass the bar. I like me. I like being able to see kind of what the steps are you know, but in music, it's not like that, right? I mean, you can kind of have an idea of what it takes to be successful. And we have metrics now that kind of tell us, all right, are we progressing, right? We have social media followers, streams, you know, all this stuff that we, so you can have more of a structured path, um, you know, and, and that was kept me in it too, right? I mean, that was probably first and foremost, what kept me in it. If, if we were putting out stuff and maybe got 10,000 views, and then next year, it still got 10,000 views. I would have told them early on, like, hey, this isn't working. We either got to change what we're doing or, or close up shop. But we never saw that. We, we, saw, we went from 10,000 to 100,000 to a million. Like, there was, never, there was never at any point in Funk Volumes history was there kind of like a halt in growth. The, the growth slowed down for sure, um, you know, but there was never a, a stopping point. So you know, that, yeah. that, that keeps you in it. If, when you see that. I just, I'm not reflecting on all the managers that I worked with as a producer, you know, cause damn, um, even with a little bit of success, like say me as a producer, say I got five major placements in a year and let's say that those major placements each paid me 10,000. So kind of on the higher side of average, that's, that's still 50000 before taxes. After taxes, I'm barely scraping by if I'm trying to pay a mortgage in the United States. My manager is only getting 20%. That's, you know, 10000 He can't live off that. So yeah. that's, that's a hell of a life, you know, to, to be taking 20% off of someone that's barely scraping by. Now, if I get a string of hits, then it's different. And that's why I think the the conversation about managers having equity is a it's one that i would traditionally have rebelled against but i have to put that into perspective if you're helping me and i have equity how can i help you back and and you know uh give give you invest in your future the way you're investing in mine yeah well, and I think that's a big reason why you became, you know, a co-CEO of Funk Volume. I mean, it wasn't just management where you could get booted at any time and that was it. Oh, yeah. I definitely wouldn't have signed up for just management. Like, I'm, I'm just Jaws manager. Like, I'm just now. But, be, but he, you know, I jumped in at a later stage than I did with Funk Volume. Like, with Funk Volume, you know, started from day one. Um but even now pivoting into television and film, I let Ja know that I'm, I, I love Ja. So I will work with him until he, if one day he told me that it's not working out, that would be the only way I would stop working. But he knows that I don't just want to manage. Like eventually I want to write shows. I want to write movies. I want to produce, you know, I want those, I want those bigger tech because I feel like I, I can do that. I feel I feel like I'm a creative person too. Um, you know, I want to invest in other things. I have a lot of other things I want to do because I know I can. And I feel like a lot of managers, you know, are the same way. And so to get put in a box of just a manager and, you know, that's why I tell young, young, if you're smart, you know, you use management to pivot into other things or maybe like start a bigger company and have multiple artists so you can diversify and manage your risk because you just never know, you know, when that job might not be. Um, 
So yeah, management, but I, I like the way that you even, you know, I think every artist and producer should try to look through the lens of a manager and just understand like what they're being compensated because I see artists and producers have unreasonable expectations of their manager in terms of, oh, yeah. in terms of the time that, that that's required. I expect them to be there every, yep. every turn. Like they, they expect so much, but like you said, if you're only making 50,000 and you know, they only get 15% of that. How do you expect them to live? But you got all these expectations for them to be at everything that you are at and expect them to contribute to everything. Like, and let's yeah. be real, making 50,000 a year, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. You no. Know, yeah. and, and, and what, so I had to, I, I gained a lot of perspective after managing an artist myself and that's why i have people contact me all the time oh you ever plan on managing producers They're like hell no i'm not managing no producers absolutely not and no disrespect i'll work with i love working with producers i started a, uh, i didn't start it i i co-started a collective um and that's been going really well we don't we're not i'm not managing anybody we're just being creative we're getting opportunities we're sharing things that's great for me. I'm, I'm happy with that. Managing people, no, nah, man, because we, oh God, I really need to get Shaw's big head ass on, on this podcast. He, um, he and I co-managed an artist and it was just, you know, we were at the, we were at the day one stage, no, no money coming in. And it was, we were doing every, you know, younger guy. Um, so if we had to go somewhere, we would be the drivers we were the booking agents. We were the the negotiators. We were the call you and make sure you're on time type of logistics guys, the road managers, the, yeah, okay, fine. We will rent this car because you're too young and the rental place won't allow you if you're under, you know, the age of 24. We, we, literally every step of the way we were, we were managing. And, um, yeah, for 20%, e even if he started making 50000 and he was getting close, and within a very short period of time, um, even with 50000 uh, you know, we're waiving our management fee, so we're not even making 10000 to split among the two of us. And, you know, my man has kids, and I'm trying to not live like a... a a bum for the rest of, of my life. So it, it puts, it, we put ourselves in a, in a position where the faith in the future really outweighed our logic. Cause it was, it's crazy to put yourself in that position. We put ourselves in that position. And um, I think, I think I, I have confidence that we would have created something great had we not gotten fired. Um, and had we not had all those those uh, conflicts, and and that's that's why I really relate to to your story with Funk Vom because it was the same type of stuff. It was just it was more emotional responses to very clear and transparent and fair expectations. But you know, you you, you see so many people and artists are you know creatives. We expect so much from our managers. Why aren't you getting me opportunities? Well, I'm trying. Why don't you get then, yourself some opportunities? Why aren't you doing this? Why am I not getting paid more? I don't know that. that look, it, I get 20% of what, what you do. So maybe you need to work harder as well. Yeah. And, you know, and, and when I talk about management, obviously there's bad managers and that shouldn't be in that role and that don't provide any value. I am just assuming that a manager is bringing value and the person is solid. So I'm, if you have a bad manager, don't give them shit. They shouldn't even be on the team. Um, but yeah, but I, I see time and time again where artists are trying to like bargain with managers. Like, you know, oh, well, maybe I could give them 10%. You know, maybe I could give them 12%. Like the value of 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 a solid person, especially especially a manager, you know, if you chase somebody away because you were trying to to 
to give them less than what they deserve, it's going to hurt you in the long run. Right. It it doesn't make sense. Like you, if you have a good manager, you should be trying to pay them more to keep them. Right. Like give them 25. I mean, I don't definitely don't lowball them. It's disrespectful because it's, it's very hard. It's a very hard job. And and like Payne said, you got to get to a pretty high point for them to even have uh, for for them to even consider it their full time position. So, yeah. I, so, you know, um, a related a related topic is, uh, you know, what what the hell is wrong with us artists? That's kind of the starting point. Um, and. You know, mo- most people who try to make, and this isn't meant to discourage anybody at all. Uh, mo- most people who try to make beats or rap for a living fail. Uh, and to believe that people are going to pay you a living wage to make beats or record rap songs is kind of crazy. And people will tell you that you are crazy. Um, and and all the ones who succeeded embrace that. Yeah, they, they'll say, yeah, I'm crazy, but watch what happens. And... I remember we had a conversation about Russ and uh, whether he was delusional or not, or some, something to that extent. And somebody commented that, uh, yes, Russ was delusional because he just believed that he was going to, or maybe, maybe Russ said something to the effect that he was delusional because he just believed that he was going to succeed no matter what, even though the odds were against him. In, in my opinion, that's not I think I think all of us have to be a little bit maybe crazy is not the word, just a little off. Um just a little different. But I don't believe that somebody like Russ was deluded. Because to be deluded is to believe in something that isn't true. And well the the, the difference between Russ saying that and somebody else saying that is like Russ was doing the work. That's my point. Yeah. Russ, Russ was doing the work. Like he was getting better. He was putting out quality content. A lot of cats are saying that, but their work is not matching. So they'll never get, so they are delusional. Like if you're not putting in the work and, and I'm sure he was watching the metrics too. I'm sure he was looking like, okay, I got a thousand followers, you know, now nah, I got 5,000 followers. Like this is working. And then as you start to see something work, probably get you more excited. Like I'm almost there. Like I'm starting to see exponential growth with what I'm doing here. So that I, I don't like to talk about the, the, are you delusional or not delusional without the work piece? Because a lot of people are delusional. I would say, and I don't think it necessarily requires delusion to be success. I think the work was more important, yeah. um, but, but he, ma- he matched it. You know, he, he matched what he was saying with the work he was putting in and he's a pretty smart cat. So I think he was watching his numbers. I mean, you, you, at the very least, you're seeing more and more money come in through his tune core every month, you know, and that's exciting. It's the same thing with Ja. Like when Ja started, man, started um, his YouTube page, started monetizing his YouTube page, it got him more excited. He's like, oh, I got $50 this month. He's like, oh, I didn't know I could get paid through YouTube. So then that check started to go from 50 to 1000 and just up and up and you know, but he's putting in the work. It's not just kind of sitting back. Oh yeah, I'm I'm about to be an independent, a sex, successful, you yeah. know, musician, and you know, not matching it with the work. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I I took issue with someone calling Russ delusional. I I take issue with, and you know, I don't know Russ, um, but if the person I was having this conversation with was accurate in saying that Russ considered himself delusional i still disagree with him um because and my point was russ also had the talent to match the work ethic and then you know his point was well russ didn't always have the talent he had to focus on getting better so that to me proves that he wasn't delusional um because an artist who like you said is truly delusional believes they don't have to work harder or to improve their art. They believe they're the best already. They don't need to do anything else and they deserve to, to succeed based on their own opinion of themselves alone. And, you know, sure. Artists are crazy. That's a kind of a problematic term um, with respect to mental health, but everybody who succeeds at, at something non-traditional is, is different. 
uh, they're stubborn and they have a lot of audacity and they have an incredible amount of faith in themselves. So like, here's an example um, about maybe 15 years ago, I had, I had a childhood friend and um, some people think I'm a jerk now. I was, I was really negative back then. And we had a, an argument. We were teenagers, but we had to argue. I was making music back then. We had a argument because I was a jerk. And he said, oh, yeah, okay, you're making music. I'll see you on the way down. You know, basically telling me you're going to fail. Because the, the odds were, you know, 18-year-old DJ Payne 1 was going to fail. You know what I'm saying? It just, most people think that someone making beats in, you know, their parents' house is just a loser. They're just going to fail. Okay, 15 years later, I'm not a failure. But this guy also became a very accomplished, groundbreaking, world-renowned journalist. And had he told me at age 17 or 18 that that's what he was going to do, I would have said, yes, yeah, see you on the way down right back. So somehow... You know, because how many people are world-renowned journalists? Very few. How many producers go platinum? Very few. We're all a little different. And, and I think that level of, of having, having your blinders on, because people are going to tell you that, that you're going to fail. People are going to look at you sideways when you tell them that you're, that you're doing anything but falling in line with a traditional nine-to-five kind of position. Uh, but it, it takes a combination of faith in yourself and being stubborn and, and keeping your, your blinders on from all the white noise around you to just continue on, let alone succeed. Uh, and I, I don't want to call that delusion. And I don't want to call that. I don't know what, what word would you, is there a word to describe that? Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, 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 it's not delusion. Um, but this conversation ties into the, the, the conversation I was telling you about on Clubhouse because, you know, I think a lot of artists, they get they get frustrated early on because there's a lot that they got to do. Right. Um, there's a there's a lot that there's a, you have to wear many hats in the beginning. So. And maybe that doesn't necessarily play in the delusion. Maybe that was a terrible pivot. But I, I think it, it, it made sense. I was trying to listen and think at the same time. Um, but in the beginning, when you have so much that you have to do, and yes, there is a lot that you need to do. This isn't, this isn't, this isn't, an, easy, this isn't an easy career. So I don't know if it's you, – you, know, you don't have to be delusional, but you definitely have to put in a lot of work and – you have to wear many hats in the beginning. Well, let me and, back up. So you're the, but, the clubhouse conversation. What was the clubhouse conversation? People were. The, the, it was just the general conversation of like being frustrated that you have to do so many things. And that's part of how you win in music, right? Just being able to push through and get the job done instead of complaining and not getting the job done. Right. Yeah, I, I don't personally ever want to hear that shit because. People will say, it, you know, I love music. It's my life. I die for music. And in the same breath say, man, I'm not trying to do all this social media stuff. Right. Like, just, just stop. Just get a job. It's not for you. And that's fine. That's fine. But stop, stop putting yourself through this torturous limbo stage all the time where you're one foot in and one foot out and you're dancing on the line. Like just, you know, if you want to do it, do it. It's going to take work if you don't, don't do it. But but my thing is, is like artists of today act like there's more work to do today than there used to be. And I'm not saying that there was more work back in the day or all I'm saying is always been a lot of work. Right. How many young people today would press up copies of their CD, record their CD at a studio, invest in the studio time, get the CDs print on them and then go slang them 
Like how many people are really going to, how many people are going to go to the beach, going to go to Venice beach and slang their CDs in front of the grocery store or wait outside of record labels for some A and R, some exec to come out. Right. Or do a rap battle in front of, you know, 200 people or be willing to sing or rap on the spot. Like it wasn't, it was never been easy. Like this has never been easy. So, you know, a lot of people from back in the day will say, well, you have it easier now. Right. There's always been things that have been tough to do. This 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 career has never been easy, you know, and I don't want to get in a debate on which era is easier. But but don't say, you know, that any path has been easy. Like and if you're not willing to put in the work now, instead of selling CDs, now you need to be on social media. You need to create a lot of content. You have to have a good understanding of, of your brand and your messaging and put quality and consistent content out all of the time. Yes, that's what you have to do. You know, I, I'm going to go as far as to say that right now. And I, I don't care who's upset about this to be a successful middle-class DIY producer or recording artist is a lot easier now than it was 20, 30 years ago, period, period. It just, we didn't have social media. We didn't have Patreon. We didn't have uh, YouTube. We didn't have monetization options for free content 20 years ago. Now we do. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the, the middle class artist didn't really exist. I mean, you either bought into the major label system and everything that that comes with, or you probably weren't ever going to get recognized. There was no option to just, you know, own everything and, you know, create a fan club or to get donations via Cash App or monetize your YouTube or you, know, you have all these revenue streams now that you can set your career up in very unique ways that just wasn't an option back in the day. You either signed up for the major label system and all of that came, came with maybe not having or probably not having all of the creative control, you know, people weighing in, telling you that you should look like this and change your name to this and all of these stories that you hear, like, is that is that what you're ready for? Is that what you want? You know, the, the fact that you just have options these days to set your career up however you want and, and find success doing that, um, to me, makes this the best time ever to be an independent artist. Yeah. So. Hey, I agree with that. Maybe we should end on that note <laughs> since we agree. Um, yeah, they said this was uh, the Music Entrepreneur Club podcast powered by BeatStars episode 83 out. We are live with our free music business mentorship program. Our sessions are twice a week, Mondays and Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Dame has something going down on Mondays and he also has a number to text so that you can get updated every time we go live. Yeah, so if you want to tune in to our Monday and Thursday live sessions, just text MEC to 844-206-7800. Um, and then on the Mondays going forward after that, so I, I'm live from 12 to 1, and then at 1.30, we'll, we'll start the text marketing live sessions as well. And if you want to sign up for that, just go to the Music Entrepreneur Club Instagram, click the link in the bio, sign up. All of this is free. Um, you know, we're not selling anything. We're not <laughs> it's actually, I mean, I don't want to pat ourselves on the back, but we spent a lot of time you know, because it's a passion project of ours and, and it's something that we enjoy doing and it's something that, that um, you know, we think is necessary. Uh, and we keep getting positive feedback. You know, I, I, at least once a week now, somebody will reach out to me and say, you know, they're finding success because obviously not just because they tune into the MEC sessions, but you know, I'm hearing a lot of success stories and, and wins um, from from things that people have learned on our platform. And that's that's ultimately what keeps me going. I, I love to hear that stuff. So if you're watching on a Monday or Thursday, check out BeatStars.live. Otherwise, everything is archived. All of our sessions are archived on all BeatStars social media. So check that out. Once again, appreciate you tuning in. We'll catch you next time for episode 84. Peace.